So far we've been thinking about the kind of representation of actions and outcomes that would be useful for decision theory. Now it's time to construct the decision theory itself. Now given that I've called this what are preferences, you might be surprised to see that this is where we're already going to give you the construction of decision theory. But the reason for that is very simple. I think the primary concern that we have as philosophers with decision theory, at least for the purposes of this course, is as Jeffrey says that it could provide an elucidation of the notions of subjective probability and what he says subjective desirability and I say preference. Why would that be good? Well I think there are two reasons and one is a reason that we have looking back to what we did in philosophy when we were studying the problem of action. So there the question was which events in your life are actions as opposed to things that merely happen to you and the idea was that the actions are those events which are appropriately related to your intentions where intentions are things caused by beliefs and desires. Now when it comes to these notions of belief and desire we didn't really have much to say about what they are. What is a belief? If we wanted to anchor that notion so we really understood what we were talking about, we had a shared understanding of what we're talking about when we say, you know, Steve believes that the piano is on fire, for example. <clears throat> if we wanted to really understand that, we've got two choices. We could just rely on ordinary everyday thought and talk, but there that might not be very good because there could be a lot of diversity between you and me. Alternatively, we could try to rely on what philosophers have said about belief, but that's kind of tricky because any two philosophers will offer you quite different accounts of what belief is, where both accounts seem to be internally coherent. And furthermore, the difference between those accounts is probably potentially quite big, but no matter how big it is, there'll be another, or even small, there'll be another theoretically coherent philosophical account that's kind of midway between those two there. So we've got both a diversity in the philosophy and their accounts of these mental states, if indeed they think they're mental states at all. Uh, and on the other hand we've got many fine differences. It's very hard to choose between them. Jeffrey's idea is that we can do better by focusing on decision theory because that will provide us with, as he says, an elucidation of the notion of subjective probability and subjective desirability. And we can map desirability uh, onto what we ordinarily talk about as desire and we can map subjective probability onto belief and anchor our thinking in that way. Now this is far from a new idea so back in the 70s Davidson was already trying to work out how to understand these notions of belief and desire. He recognized that we need a motivational and a factive uh, belief-like uh, structure in order to explain action but he wasn't sure what they were. He quickly came to this view. He said, we should think of meanings and beliefs as interrelated constructs of a single theory, just as we already view subjective values, he means preferences in my terms, and probabilities, subjective probabilities, as interrelated constructs of decision theory. So Davidson says this is exactly right. Once we've got a really good decision theory, we can think of belief and desire as interrelated constructs of the theory. The theory elucidates those notions for us. And so either we don't need the informal notions of belief and desire at all, or we just map them on to our theoretical constructs. So this is marvelous from the point of view of philosophy, but it's not just philosophy that needs an elucidation. You remember when we were looking at the dual process theory of instrumental action, according to which actions are guided by a habitual process and a goal-directed process, in characterizing the goal-directed process we appeal to what I informally called beliefs and desires. Dickinson used slightly more technical sounding language, he phrases it in terms of representations of value and representations of uh, action outcome links, but still they are roughly beliefs and desires. And you will look in vain in Dickinson as much as you do in the philosophers for an explanation of what these things are. Right? What are these things supposed to B. What is the belief or if you like the action outcome representation? What are the desires here, the representations of value? Dickinson's theory gives no answer to that question whatsoever, gives no explanation of them. Now I think the right way to go here is to appeal to decision theory and it's very likely that Dickinson himself would be sympathetic to just that idea. That we characterize these notions and their connection to action more carefully by appeal to decision theory.
So this is exactly what we want, both from the point of view of the psychological theory of action that we've considered and the philosophical theory. We want this elucidation very much. Now, in order to get the elucidation, we're going to ask a question that doesn't sound like we're defining or elucidating anything at all. Right. I'm going to ask the question, what, sorry, that word what is missing here, what is the evidential basis for ascribing probabilities and preferences, and how does the evidence support the ascriptions? Right. So bear with me here. In asking this question, we are eventually going to provide the elucidation that Jeffreys wants, but it's actually helpful for us to think about it as if we were looking for, as if we already knew what subjective probabilities and preferences were, and we were just trying to gather what the evidence for them would be. Now let me show you how this is somewhat problematic by imagining this scenario. So you're given a choice, and you can open the red door, in which case you will either, depending on what condition obtains, get a banana or some broccoli. Or alternatively, you can open the blue door, and then again, depending on what condition obtains, you'll either get some chocolate or some broccoli. Now let me suppose, for the sake of argument, that you do in fact open the red door. Right. What can I conclude? It might be tempting to think, gosh, you know, this is a sign that you want the bananas more than you want the chocolate. That's what's different between the two choices. The problem is that I don't know, though, I don't know what your subjective probabilities are. So it might be that you subjectively think that if you open this door, you've got a 50-50 chance of getting the bananas. Whereas if you open the blue door, you've got a 50-50 chance of getting the chocolate. Now, in that case, if that's your subjective probabilities, then I suspect that you do prefer bananas to chocolate. I don't know whether you prefer bananas to broccoli, but I know that you prefer them to chocolate, right? Because otherwise you would have taken the blue door. That's simple. The problem, of course, is that I don't know what your subjective probabilities are. And I don't want to make the assumption that your subjective probabilities line up with the actual probabilities. So even if the condition is the landing of a fair coin on the head side, you might say, well, objectively, that's 50-50. It doesn't follow from that that you think that the probability of the coin landing heads is 50-50. You may know me well enough to think I'm quite likely using a dodgy coin. So it may be, from your point of view, that what you think is this. If you go for the banana route, you've got a 50-50 chance. But if you go for the chocolate route, I'm using this really super dodgy coin, and there's virtually no chance it's going to land on the chocolate. Right. So you may think, in effect, that I'm tricking you. In that case, the choice that you've made opening the red door is perfectly consistent with you preferring chocolate over bananas. So the lesson here is very simple. Since I don't know what your subjective probabilities are, I cannot infer your preferences. And conversely, and conversely, which option you choose is a function of what you think the probabilities of the condition obtaining are, and what your preferences are concerning bananas, broccoli, and chocolate. If I knew one, I could infer something about the other, but not knowing either, I appear to be stuck. Now, historically, in decision theory, for some time, people just accepted that they were stuck, and they attempted to construct theories which assumed that there was some kind of objective value that everybody was seeking, right? Some kind of pleasure or happiness. They just thought, you know, chocolate is objectively better than bananas. Now, in a way, that's fair enough, but it gives us a theory which is extremely limited. So here's Nick Chater, and he says correctly that the revealed preference revolution of the 1930s replace the supposition that people are attempting to optimize an externally given criterion, right? Chocolate is just objectively better bananas or some kind of psychologically uh, criterion to do with utility units of pleasure and pain. We replaced that supposition and we got away with it. That's the magic that you are about to see. How is the trick done? Well, the trick is actually due to the philosopher Ramsey. Uh, so Ramsey, back in the, I think this is also from the 30s or the 40s, in any case, it's cited in the notes here. Ramsey discovered something 
absolutely incredible. If we could identify two things, and we knew that you weren't indifferent, so I don't know whether you prefer chocolate to bananas or bananas to chocolate, but I know you're not indifferent as between those two things, right? So first of all, I know that. Secondly, I can identify a condition where you're kind of indifferent as to whether or not the condition obtains. You're just indifferent as to whether or not the condition obtains. In that case, then I can give you a pair of options, and I know if you're indifferent between these two options, that you think the subjective probability of the condition occurring is 0.5. So that's the first thing. Then the second thing is once I've got that, once I've got that one subjective probability, Ramsey showed how I can use that to create a kind of ranking and I can infer, I can infer your preferences and your subjective probabilities from that one single point. So this is an amazing theory. Of course, I'm not giving you a full formal presentation here, although you can find an excellent and very easy to follow presentation in Jeffrey, along with many other books that cover this ground now. Uh, I think Jeffrey is still probably the best book uh, by a philosopher, and it's also one that's kind of got theoretical interest in its own right. But still, what I want to do is to show you informally how this works. So let me go back to my red door and my blue door. But this time what you'll see is that in both cases you're choosing between chocolate and bananas. In both cases you're choosing between chocolate and bananas. But now I'm going to mix things up a little bit by introducing this big urn here, right? So for some reason statisticians always keep their balls in an urn. I don't know why I haven't got an urn, I would just use a bucket. But uh, anyway, I was going to follow the orthodoxy. So here's my, here's my urn. Now in this bucket are some red balls and some non-red balls. And what I'm going to do is very simple. I'm going to draw a ball, and whether the ball is red or not red is going to influence what you get. So if you open the red drawer, door, and the ball I take is not red, you get the bananas, and if it's red, you get the chocolate. Conversely, if you choose the blue door, things are just flipped around there. Things just flipped around. You see how I'm doing this? So now if I get the non-red ball, you get the chocolate, and if I get the red ball, you get the bananas. Now I know that you're not indifferent as between chocolate and bananas, and I know that you absolutely don't care whether the ball is red or non-red. That's an ethically neutral condition for you. That being the case, what Ramsey says is, if you're absolutely neutral as between these two, so you don't care which choice you make, you regard them equally likely, then it must be the case that subjectively you assign 0.5 to the probability of a red ball being drawn. Yeah, do you see that? To see why, suppose that you didn't assign 0.5 to the probability of a red ball being drawn, right? So let's suppose that um, you thought that the probability of red be ball being drawn was more likely than not. Yeah, maybe 0.9 or something like that. Nine out of 10 balls in here are red. Well, in that case, you ought to have a preference as between these two bets. If you prefer the chocolate, you take the red door. If you prefer the bananas, you would take the blue door. You wouldn't be indifferent as between the two. So it's very easy to see, I hope, by thinking about this particular example, how your indifference as between these two bets, open the red door, or open the blue door, must be a sign that you assign equal probabilities to a red ball as to a non-red ball. If that weren't the case, you would have a preference between one of these two bets on the assumption that you either prefer chocolate to bananas or conversely, you're not indifferent between those two. So in this way, Ramsey is able, without knowing anything about what you prefer, nor anything about your subjective probabilities, to infer both of those from a series of choices that you make. So this is an incredible discovery. Your actions are a function of two variables which are largely independent from each other. What you think the subjective probabilities of various conditions are and what your preferences are. Uh, so in effect, beliefs and desires, if you like. Now Ramsey's method allows us to infer both of these things simultaneously just from the observations of a sequence of actions that you perform. That's the magic that he works. How does he do it? Well, of course, as always, there is something built in. There are some background assumptions that the derivation needs. Now, these background assumptions are going to turn out to be pretty important. It's not critical for us that we have 
we can actually do the uh, mathematical derivation. It's a bit of maths here. It's a fun bit of maths. And you may have done this if you've taken an economics course, for example. You may have worked through this. And it's a lot of fun to do that. And it's not terribly difficult if you want to do it. And you're reasonably technically minded. Uh, it's certainly no difficult than the first year logic course that you will have taken. Um, but for our purposes, it's not critical. What we need to know is what some of those axioms are. So what are the assumptions that we have made in characterizing the preferences? The first is that your preferences are transitive. So if you prefer bananas to broccoli and you prefer chocolate to bananas, then you've also got to prefer chocolate to broccoli. You're not allowed to have preferences that break that assumption. Otherwise, the derivation wouldn't work. Secondly, we're also assuming that as between any two alternatives, there is a way that these things are related. So one of them is either at least as preferred as the other or conversely, or conversely. So you can be indifferent as between the two, but you can't have things that are just completely incommensurable, right? So a lifetime supply of chocolate and world peace, you have to have a preference as between those two things. You can't say, look, there's just no way to compare them. They're too different. So transitivity and completeness mean that we have a partial ordering. The preference relation is a partial ordering thing. Further assumption that we need is continuity. Now you can look this up in uh, Steele and Stefansson, but I'm not, I'm not gonna give you continuity as such here. Informally, we might say this, continuity means that there's no outcome so bad that you're not willing to take a gamble that could in principle bring that outcome about, provided that the chance of the bad outcome is super small. Right? Um, so the uh, dissolving of the planet into a small ball would be, for most people, a pretty bad outcome. Right? And according to the continuity axiom, there is, uh, because that's an outcome, there is, there has to be a case where you would take a risk that that would happen, although it would have to, of course, be an incredibly small probability that it would happen. And finally, there's another axiom that I'm not going to reveal in full. This is the independence axiom. Roughly speaking, if you prefer A to B, so if you prefer chocolate to bananas, then you also have to prefer chocolate and broccoli to bananas and broccoli. Yeah. So that the adding that broccoli, as long as it's added on both sides, is completely irrelevant to what your preferred outcome is. Adding or adding something to an outcome won't make, uh, adding something to both of a pair of outcomes won't change your preference between the two outcomes. That's the independence axiom. So these are the four main axioms that are needed in order for us to be able to derive from an observation of your actions, both your preferences and simultaneously your subjective probabilities. So we have a theory which assumes the notion of action, that we have some outcomes and involves some background assumptions. And it's then able to give you a characterization of preference, subjective probability, and according to many researchers, also rationality, it provides you with a characterization of what rationality is. Now what's important, I think, from our point of view is what I said at the start. We can regard the axioms as implicitly defining preference and subjective probability. More carefully, more carefully, preference and subjective probability are constructs of the theory. So when we started this section, you might have been thinking, all right, I have some sense of what preferences are and I'm gonna come with a model of preferences. But that's actually the wrong way to think about decision theory. Decision theory tells you what preferences are. You don't start with a notion of preference and a notion with subjective probability. You get that notion from decision theory. And when, of course, we can see decision theory as making more precise, some rough and ready notions like belief and desire if we want. But what decision theory is providing us is not an elucidation of things that we already understand. It's providing us a construction, a theory, relative to which those things are internal workings. That's how we understand what they are. So it's in this sense, I think, that Jeffrey is right, that we can see decision theory as an elucidation of the notions of subjective probability and, as I say, preference.
Now I want to really ram this home. This is a terribly important point, so it's important for you to really hold on to it. What we've done is shown that Ramsey's method allows us to infer both subjective probability and preferences from observations of actions that you perform. But to be honest, we're not super interested in inference. The inferring isn't quite right. Yeah? This is still the sort of perspective where you kind of think, OK, I know what preference and subjective probability are. All I'm doing is I'm able to work out what your particular preference is and what subjective probabilities you assign to different conditions are. Right? That's all it does. But that isn't quite right. The truth is that the demonstration that these can be inferred is the proof that we can see preference and subjective probabilities as constructs of decision theory. Right? So the reason that we're interested in this inference, going from the actions to extracting preference and subjective probabilities, the reason we're interested in that is because it demonstrates that the theory really does characterize those notions. After all, if I'd just given you those axioms, you would have had no idea at all whether the axioms were sufficient to characterize the notions or not. It's this inference that tells us, yes, yes, those axioms really do allow us to characterize the notions. So as I said here, we're not really interested in actually inferring. The demonstration that we can infer is what shows that the axioms are sufficient to define the preference and the subjective probability, those two notions. So at this point, it looks like we're doing really well. We've used decision theory to anchor notions which are important to us in the philosophical problem of action and also in Dickinson's dual process theory of action. So far, so good.